In the 90s, horror games were the golden boy. Now they're the damn bus boy of the gaming industry, being abused by shitty indie developers as a quick cash grab. PT gave us a taste of what could be, but as we all know, PT got the axe after Konami got the hump, and with the void of PT, there was a hole to be filled. Many games try to capitalize on this, games like Infliction. Visage is also a game that took inspiration from the PT demo, and I would argue it's one of the best horror game experiences I've had in recent years. So let's begin. Visage begins with an involuntary game of Russian roulette. You really just can't beat quality family time. The rest of the fam are f***ing amateurs and get capped so the shooter has to come in clutch and secure the victory royale. Double kill. Triple kill. After this, you wake up in the PT room, almost verbatim. You get up, you stumble into the hallway and boom, we're in the game. We have control. Holy hell, this house is scary. The first few moments are disorientating, you're confused, you have a lot of questions, not just from a narrative standpoint, but also from the player's perspective, coming from this violent and horrific intro, and checking into this quiet and empty house without context, a goal or any guidance, it's very jarring and immediately puts the player on the back foot. Every time you enter into a room, you can click the lights off and on. It essentially becomes the ritual of the moment to moment gameplay. Entering each new area, finding the light switches and getting the room lit up, it's a basic feature, but because of how amazing the house and lighting is designed, it's very satisfying. While we're talking about the lighting, this is probably a good time to get the graphics and world design out of the way, which are just f***ing chef's kiss. This is the Mona Lisa of creepy house design. I think the most important aspect is how the house genuinely feels lived in. Every light, book and picture feels like it's been taken from a real family home. You almost feel like you're intruding into someone's living space as you're walking around. The game slacks in some areas, particularly some of the monster design and animations being janky. Not Lisa, PT janky, more Andromeda janky. But hey, Andromeda had a budget of 100 million. This is an indie game made by like 10 people with a budget of 70k. So I think we can cut them a little slack. Back to the game where we're clutching our rears and jumping at scary light bulbs. We quickly make it into the hallway where we can begin the actual story. You begin these chapters by interacting with one of three objects in the hallway that relate to the previous inhabitants, all of which, surprise surprise, met a rather unpleasant fate. They had to pay for a TV license. We're gonna start with Lucy's chapter, the creepy kid whose painting we find upstairs. Haunted houses and little girls, a match made in heaven. Lucy's chapter begins in the upstairs girl's bedroom where we have to find more paintings. Eventually our investigation leads us to the wardrobe and this lovely encounter. Now we head down to the living room where we find that the TV is playing its Friday on repeat, very spooky. On the counter we find a key to the basement which is where we make our way next. Unlocking the basement and looking down we get a serious case of nope. We get a case of the f*** that. The nope moment is something we get in a lot of games. Nope. Unfortunately, my fears are well warranted because this basement is spoopy. It's dark and claustrophobic and turning every corner was sort of like a mini game. Will my heart stop or not? Once we reach the heart of the basement, we find a little kid's play area with a camera flashing. We have to grab this camera to progress further, leading to camera flashy ghosty time. This area has a bunch of childlike drawings and paintings that you have to follow, all of which can only be seen by the flash of the camera. Using the flash and following the trail, we take a little haunted house tour, eventually ending up in the office where we get to see some of Banksy's unpublished work. After this, we have to follow the trail back down to the basement door, which is now glowing red. Now, being a genius with an IQ over 300, I know that a glowing red door in general is not a great sign. In a haunted house specifically, this is bad news. Going through the door, we end up in the forest. We ain't in Kansas anymore, Toto. Here, we find a tree house that we have to ransack. After a little searching, we find a hidden key, and this is when things go bad. 
Waking up and we're back in the basement. Weird man. Hey, it sure is dark in here. I really should turn the lights. Oh my freaking gowd. The light switches are gone. This is one of, if not the best moment in the game. Up to this point, light switches have been your safe haven. You know where each one is in every room and now they're all gone. The game never even directly addresses this fact. It just shows you a box of light switches chucked on the sofa and the game's like, nah man, that's your problem bro, but good luck. This section is intense and it made me sweat as something fierce, but it's beautifully executed, taking away our only sense of security and leaving us afraid and vulnerable. To up the ante, for the next section, the ghost of Lucy will be roaming around the hallways ready to chase the player down and kill them. These encounters are randomly generated though, and to be honest, they kinda suck. I know, a ghost game where the ghost encounters kind of suck is weird, but let me explain. Visage has two types of random encounters, ghost encounters and haunting encounters. The haunting encounters are great. These are random little events that happen at any time while exploring the house that give the player a little fright. Because it's completely random, it does have its moments where it'll catch you off guard and make you panic. But those random ghost encounters are a different story. Uh, uh, no, no, leave me alone. The problem is, there's no way to kill or fight these ghosts, and when they reach you, it's an instant game over. This is an awful combination when it's mixed with random AI and a small house with a bunch of awkward rooms and corridors. Speaking generally, I hate the whole run and hide mechanics in modern horror games. I understand it's easier from a development standpoint, but I much prefer being able to fight back in some way. Bruh. Even if it was just allowing us to escape the first couple of grabs and then killing us later. Of all the issues with the game, this is the biggest gripe I have. Either let us fight back against the monsters or they better be fucking impeccably well programmed and balanced. If not, it's going to piss off the players. And later in the game, you get a sledgehammer and I was buzzing because I thought that meant we could bop some heads. But no, you still get murked straight away. What happened to the good old days of bonking monsters with pipes? Bang, okay. Let's all agree to ban the run and hide mechanics. It's boring and you become desensitized to it so quick. The best comparison would be Outlast. The first few chases are terrifying, but by the end of the game, they're meaningless. It's just a casual stroll to wherever the next locker is. After further exploration, we find ourselves back in Lucy's room where there's a painting of a door, but much like Doodle Bob, Lucy's drawings come to life. After a few hits, we're able to pass through the door and enter this creepy room with a bunch of bird cages and furniture. Now this is a maze game where Lucy will slowly move towards you and you have to try and search through all the furniture in order to find a specific key to get out. The key does spawn randomly here, so there's some replay value, but in general, running in circles in the dark searching for a key, not a highlight, I would have to say. Now we get a few scripted moments from Lucy before she tosses us out of the room and into the hallway. After some more searching, we find a mannequin jaw in the sink. Mannequins are really just the gift that keep on giving. The next few moments require us to reunite the jaw with its body, who thanks us by opening a spooky wardrobe containing a demon. Thanks for nothing, Manny. Here we have to play another game of kissy catch with a ghosty while making our way through a maze of doors, opening wardrobes and traversing the deepest corners of the house. Yeah, it ain't the one, chief. I've been pretty kind to the game up to this point, but this area really gets my balls in a vice so I have to give a little bit of a complaint here. This area sucks ass. At this point of the game it will be the demon chasing you not Lucy and if you thought Lucy was bad this asshole consistently spawns on top of you instantly killing you. Some bullshit. That wouldn't be such a pain, but the low times are actually incredibly long. So being instantly killed frequently is just a massive burden for the pacing of this part of the game. I think the biggest problem with this area, the game really wants the players to utilize the flash and the camera. Now that's a problem because it's a confusing, tight, corridored area that is consistently pitch black and for mystical reasons, your fucking lighters aren't working. So the only way you can see is in flash intervals of the camera, which is more disorientating and it is helpful. Yeah, sure, it's spooky, but it becomes very difficult to find your way. And when you're trying to do this in an area you're not familiar with, while being hunted down and consistently killed by a randomly spawning ghost, it leads to one of the most frustrating areas of the game. In this section with the wardrobe, the demon will randomly spawn in and kill you if you open up the wrong door, you know, if the stupid prick is actually awake. No, thanks. 
in the end, you're not even supposed to open them. They're irrelevant. There's a hole at the back right of the room that you're actually supposed to drop down. These wardrobes are meaningless. I hate to say it, but clearly this was just added to pad out the chapter so it feels like there's more to it. Next, we find a gap that's a little bit more than a small hop away, but unfortunately, we've got concrete slabs in our shoes, so we're not able to make the jump. Instead, we have to find a nice plank of wood to get across. Of course, we can't just use any old wood we find. No, we have to find the specific spooky wood to get across. We even make our way through a physical representation of the internet. Now, as lovely as that symbolism is, there is no ability to jump in this game, meaning if you want to get up each ledge, instead of just mantling or being able to jump, you have to find an interaction area, click on it, and you'll move up. Now, this is hit or miss because there's no indication as to where you should click. You see this door here? I should be able to click to get up, right? Nowhere along here can you click. Instead, you have to look for this small little bin ledge and mantle up it. That took me ages to figure out. Again, I thought it was broken, but no, just poor area design for this section. Now, all the running around this house has made us a bit sweaty, so we decide to take a little bath. This is the end of Lucy's chapter. We see Lucy in her final moments after being manipulated and tormented by the demon. She locks herself in the bathroom and tears her own jaw off. Soon thereafter, passing from blood loss. After this, we give her her jaw back. She's thrilled. She's able to resume her career as a professional jawbreaker eater. I suppose with this chapter, perhaps they felt it wasn't long enough, and so they felt the need to try and pad out the timing by adding a lot of unnecessary things that, in my opinion, do more to hinder the chapter's quality than improve upon it. But it's not the end of the world, it's more just a mild frustration. Overall, this chapter gets one jaw out of two ghosty girls. Chapter 2 centers around Dolores. This is where the game shamelessly rips off of the granny video game. Like a cup of tea? This chapter and the ghost involved are the closest to the PT demo that inspired the game. Dolores is very similar to Lisa and I'm all about that. The chapter kicks off with us getting a key for the mirror room. After unlocking the door and checking our quiff looks good in the mirror, next destination is the living room where there's a new addition, a giant object covered in a blanket. Another mirror? This must be the mirror's edge game I've heard so much about. Oh shit, there's somebody up there. So now we've got to find a hook to get the attic open and uh, oh god. Hey wait, come back bitch. Do you have time to talk about our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ? After following Ghosty Man, we get the hook, allowing us to get into the attic, the best place to spend your time in a haunted house, the attic and the basement, just the nicest places. The hook itself is found wedged into a photo of a husband and wife, specifically Dolores and her husband. Ooh, foreshadowing. Up in the attic and unfortunately there's no old Yu-Gi-Oh card deck stored up there, just a bunch of shitty old furniture and that. But after a stroll through, we drop down a hatch and back into the parents' bedroom, but this time it's old just like that granny gal them spooky. Goal here is to get all the parts to build a baby's crib toy. All these pieces are scattered throughout the house and require the player to solve a series of environmental puzzles to find out hey, what the f*** is that? Uh, hello? G Guten Morgen? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Screw this, I'm hiding under the bed. <laughs> After leaving the room, the player will spawn back in the house. This time, there's a cum trail leading all the way down to the progress room that we have to follow. Now we see this disgusting, fleshy hole, leaving us with only one choice. Climb down the umbilical cord. After spotting the real Slim Shady, we find ourselves in the mirror room. Taking a closer look, we can get some ring star reflection shenanigans. Player has to loop the mirror until they are entitled to a jump scare. God damn, man, that was scurry. How about I literally jump to my death now? Fortunately, it turns out we're wearing the environmental suit from Half-Life because we take no fall damage. Sorry, it's Sean from the future in the old studio editing my little heart out. I thought I'd do my due diligence and research what the environmental suit actually provides. My inkling was correct. In fact, it does not protect from fall damage. I am not a true gamer man. I am a fraud. I apologize. So you can stop typing your angry comment now. I've seen what I've done wrong. I've seen the errors of my way. I've signed myself into gamer rehab school. I apologize. Now we have to get the crib toys. The problem is they're all hidden behind different mirrors and we have no way to get into them. Fortunately for us, old ghosty poo left his hammer in our car windscreen so we can smash that shit up. 
You can carry an item in each hand or one two-handed item with the ability to store four to five items in your inventory. Any key items you drop and leave behind will magically reappear in the utility room. The house must be haunted by a quiet housewife or something because that mess just cleans itself up. Now that we're smashing mirrors, we're not only going to have many years of bad luck, but Dolores will also start to randomly spawn and attack the player from this point. The first mirror contains a room filled with clocks and windows and decorative plates. It looks as if there could be a decent puzzle to solve here but it turns out that there's just a giant fetus room with a cheat sheet you can look at for the answers. Uh, yeah, makes sense, right? This is a shame. They could have maybe found a way to make the environments in certain rooms actually hold the answers to this puzzle. Perhaps only having three clocks in the house and you have to match their times with the clocks in the mirror room. I just feel like having a bit of paper with all the answers on it is a bit of a cop out, but I guess the directions of this level is already ambiguous enough. Maybe they didn't need even more complex puzzles. I don't know. I just felt a bit cheated. Completing this mirror will reward the player with a baby monitor. Hmm. The next mirror we smash leads to a chase sequence with Dolores spawning behind you to ask about your extended warranty. The problem is there's no way out at the end. Only a clearly cracked floor. Now we have to start frantically hitting the floorboards with the hammer to break through. Yeah, you better hope you didn't drop that hammer after breaking the mirror for some reason or your ass is going to look like a Tootsie Roll. This scene is incredibly tense. It takes about five hits with the hammer to break through and the wind up animation and hit animation are incredibly sluggish. All the while, you know Dolores is coming towards you. It makes for one of the most intense moments of the game. Now we're in the meat hanging room, except Dolores being a silly bugger, she's accidentally swapped cured hams with corpses. You have to explore the room and find out which light shafts correlate to the correct symbols on the corpses. Once complete, you head down and there's another hole to drop into. Holes and dropping through them is a massive theme in Visage. It's not clear if this is a conscious or coincidental theme. However, this mechanic has frequently been used in psychological horror games as a device to represent players tumbling deeper into madness or entering into dangerous places with no means of safe return. The Silent Hill franchise was famous for this implementation. I think it would be a safe bet to assume the devs used this to a similar effect. Heading through this shaft, we end up in the basement, which has been locked up until this point. What the hell? What's going on here? Hey guys, it's Nicole. The basement has more mirrors for you to break into. One of them has a nice church, Hail Mary. Here we can use the crank to get a knife stuck into a crucified bloke. We need this knife to so grab it and head over to our next mirror. This one contains Dolores hitting us up with a little monologue. Always find a way to be Here we can grab the tea box key. Hell yeah. Let's head back up now and check upstairs. Instead, we're greeted by Dolores, who asks a very simple request. I want my baby back. Roger that doll, one baby coming up. I don't really understand why she's trying to kill you when she's just asking for your help. Perhaps she didn't realize that getting her baby back would entail you breaking her limited edition Gucci mirrors. The next mirror we have to smash is located in the upstairs office, where we'll find this guy sat there with a bunch of knives in him. And you know what he's missing? Another knife. This man is the corpse of Dolores, his husband. She had lost her mind and eventually murdered him in a schizophrenic rage. Using this key on the door at the back, we find a hidden room with a box containing our first crib toy. Hallelujah. Upon trying to leave, we see that George has decided he didn't like being shanked up. What is this, central London, you Let's see how you like it. Forcing us to backpedal to the corner of the room and cry like a baby until the scary music stops. Now we have to head to the attic to unlock the tea box for Dolores. Why is she storing this tea box in the attic again. We don't know. The woman is off her rockers. She mistook her bloody husband for a pincushion. After dropping into the bedroom for a second time, there's a couple of key details to note. If we grab out the baby monitor, we get this sequence. Zero, three, five, zero, Remember that because it's important for later. Secondly, if we head over to this wall and knock down a painting, we get to see this sequence hidden in the back room. Again, this will come into play later, but for now, let's head to the bathroom and smash another mirror. This puzzle contains a series of hallways the player can go down, each one returning the player to the start if they choose the wrong direction. This can seem like a guessing game, but hey, remember that number we got earlier? Well, this is where they come into their own. Each number actually correlates to a clock time above the hallway that you have to take in succession. Yeah, I had to Google that one. A lot of puzzles in this game 
game feel like they would be nearly impossible without occasionally looking at a guide. Not because they're inherently hard, but just because a lot of them require very specific items you could easily have missed if you weren't paying attention at the right time. After making our way through, we're treated to this lovely scene. And now we're back in the basement, except it's different. All the walls and doors are coated in this disgusting, wet, visceral material that's very disturbing and grotesque. It's a similar mechanic to the removal of the light switches earlier in the game. Give us an environment we know but corrupt and twisted. It's a very effective way to make the player feel unsettled, to let them know they're in danger. After heading back to the basement and giving Dolores the extra caffeinated classic English breakfast tea, Dolores will mess your shit up because she actually wanted the herbal tea, the fussy bitch. I'll show you, you damn scoundrel what bread you're worth Upon waking up, she's decided to cook her ass because we'd be looking like a snack. We quickly break our way out and find that she's left us another toy and a crowbar. I guess she has no need for it after caving your head in, but here we take the crowbar because we need it in the next mirror in order to grab the compass that's been hiding behind a window. Of course, it just makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you couldn't just break the window with a hammer because, you know, video game logic. But now that we have the compass, there's only one place to go. Silent Hill, baby! Hell yeah. Kojima, eat your ass out. This game has it all. The quality control in this larger section is slightly poor. You can really see the smaller budget coming into play when the scale is dialed up, but it's still great to get out and stretch our little legs. Using the compass, we can pass through the previously unpassable fog, making our way through a small town and a graveyard, eventually uncovering another toy for the crib. Now that we've cleared out the town mirror, we have to make our way back to the giant fetus room, except now the baby can be taken. Grab that baby and bring it to Dolores. <laughs> I cannot express how confusing and difficult it is to track this chapter. If you're having a hard time following all the steps and how or why they're happening, don't worry, you're not stupid. This level is just all over the place, literally and figuratively. Now we've only got one crib toy left to grab, located in the living room and accompanied by a nice spook. Here we have to solve a little painting puzzle. Remember that picture we saw early in the video? Well, it's payoff time, baby. Once inside the room, we see a hospital bed, except it's missing an IV drip. Luckily, we were able to grab one from Johnny Sin's the pincushion earlier, so we attached the IV drip and it given the ultimate reward. A final crib toy, thank the Lord. It's time to assemble that shit. This reveals a hidden key, a key that unlocks a music box. Again, we have a crowbar and a sledgehammer. Why couldn't we just smash it open? God damn video game logic. This box has a vinyl in it. Now, can the astute gamers watching this video remember where we seen a record player before? Vote now in the comments section. If you guess B in the attic, you're an idiot. It was in the basement. This next room is very similar to the relativity painting by Escher. It has to have taken inspiration from it. The puzzle in this room is one of sound, so if you're deaf, you're f***. We have to listen to the classical music. The louder it gets, the closer we are to getting out of the maze. This isn't randomised, which is a shame for people hoping for repeat playthroughs. After making our way out through a maze of cribs, we eventually arrive at the closet behind the parents' room. This time, we're looking through the peephole from the other side. 
we get an insight into Dolores' final moments where she says goodbye to her child before committing end life, presumably directly after murdering her husband, another chapter complete and another tragic victim of the house. Overall, the Dolores chapter would be best described as sporadic. It's incredibly complex and confusing and not necessarily in a good way. I'd be lying if I said I didn't have to refer to a guide a couple of times, even on my second playthrough, but at the moments where it works, it cleverly merges two different timelines into one creepy narrative with a lot of variety to spice the chapter up. Overall, it gets one human pin cushion out of 10 matricides. The final chapter, Rack Hands. This chapter begins in the living room where we find a wheelchair just sitting there. Yeah, not a great sign, wheelchairs sitting around, but let's have a seat. Throw it flashback. <laughs> This time we're sent back to the house as it was when Rackhands lived in it. Similar to the time jump we saw in the Dolores chapter, here we get an insight into Rackhands' life in his final days, his mental state steadily breaking down before he's eventually overwhelmed by a demon residing in the house. Heading upstairs, we find that the office room is locked. This time, there's a growth clinging to the door, blocking your way, and it turns out you just have to poke an eye in the painting behind the door. After that, we head in and find our second wheelchair. After a short loading screen, we slowly begin to wake up and it won't take players long to realize where we are, a hospital. This was a really surprising location jump, especially from an indie studio. Considering all the assets would have to be recreated just to fit the hospital environment, it's a big undertaking for a small team. Personally, I think the level of detail is significantly reduced here in the hospital than the scenery you find in the house. Don't get me wrong, it's still very well made, but it just lacks that same level of detail and believability that the house had. And because you're not able to return to the hospital, there aren't as many collectibles or easter eggs to find while exploring, which is a bit of a shame. But while we're nicely on the subject of easter eggs and collectibles, this is probably a good part of the video to talk about them. One of the main collectibles the game offers are the Russian dolls. No, not those Russian dolls, these Russian dolls. They serve no point at all other than, hey, here's a collectible. I mean, what kind of a weirdo collects those dolls anyway, specifically in a life and death situation? Maybe you're the only spook freak in this house after all. Shock twist, it puts the lotion in the basket. There are other collectibles you find throughout your travels, you know, cassette tapes, comic book pages, all of which will offer more insight into the previous crimes and lives of the occupants of the house. House. Now when you're not running around and filling your scrapbooks with pictures of dead people, you could run into one of the many easter eggs this game has to offer. We've got the room from Silent Hill 4. A talking kitchen scene. He's nuts. Always on drugs and alcohol. Don't mind him. He's probably out of it anyway. Everyone who lives here is f***ed up anyway. F*** him. Let's move on. There's a pack of punch coffee cup easter egg. Mm, hey, this coffee sure is delicious. It really packs a punch. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. There's plenty of other funny easter eggs you can find, but I won't spoil them all. You can hunt them down yourselves if you ever pick up the game. But yeah, this game is like the video game adaptation of Ready Player One. It got easter eggs coming out the yazoo. Back to the hospital. 
and we find ourselves wandering down the hallways, looking for a way out. This escape is rudely interrupted by Unity Asset Man, sorry, I mean Rakans. He's either 12 feet tall or we're actually playing as a dwarf, which would be creepy if he were a scary monster, but no, he's a giant naked blender man. It looks ridiculous. Along the way, the power to the hospital goes out, which would normally add some incredible tension to the game, but instead at this point the game gives you an infinite flashlight, the first and only in the game. While it is super handy, it does remove some of the tension that exploring the dark hospital would have had if it had just been our lighters or relying on environmental lighting. I don't know, the flashlight never runs out, it's very bright and it illuminates the entire hallway, which means the tension isn't quite the same. Returning to our stroll through the hospital, we're making our way towards the exit. Or what might be the exit, I don't know, the signage is a little weak. I mean, I'm pretty sure this is a window, not a fire exit, no wonder Rakan got confused, this cannot meet fire regulations. Wake it up from the fall and we're shock meme template back in the house. As we've learned from our previous experiences up to this point, follow the creepiest looking trail you can find and you're off to a good start. Ah oh, shit, another blockage. Time for a bit of pokey eye. Bulky bulky. With our little legs being tired, we decide to take another seat in the next wheelchair we find, apparently learning nothing from our past experiences. Now we get our first look at the chapter's new enemies, Melted Face Man. Uh, this is the weakest monster in the game by a long shot, essentially boiling down to an action man whose face has been melted with a Bic lighter. In our second return to the hospital, we turn a corner and see this. Oh shit. Overall I enjoyed it, it mixed up the pace of exploration and I was actually on edge while passing through. I had to just try not to pass out looking at those darn cute ankles. Grabbing the keys and heading for the exit, you accidentally kick over a can of monster energy, pissing off the monsters and kicking off a chase sequence. The hospital is pitch black at this point, the way out marked by the low hue of the red exit sign. This was a really nice touch, it looks very ominous but also removes the annoyance of aimlessly running in the dark. The next sequence of the game really mixes it up another chase sequence who would have thought being genius ghostbusters at this point we decide to head back down to the basement of the hospital i don't know why maybe our guy wanted to grab some insulin or something but our second visit to the basement actually offers a really great scene after switching on the elevator and heading there to escape big racker the crutchy man decides to start chasing you again so we dash off making our way to the elevator only for it to open revealing that the elevator is overweight because of the corpses sat inside of it now we have to slowly drag out the bodies all the while were being hunted. This forces the player to have to run away multiple times, gaining just enough distance to pull one more body out before dashing off again. The game of cat and mouse had become very tiring at this point, but this small change to the formula was a welcome one that really created a memorable moment in the game, for me at least. Once in the elevator and at the top, we get a kind of copy and paste of the previous nervous kid with pissy pants section where we have to look at the floor and pass through. After which we have to find the exit while being chased by Melted Waxman. Another dip and we're back in the house. Man, I wonder how many times I've said we're back in the house in this video. This is like a COVID simulator. You only leave the house for a few moments and then it's straight to the hospital and back to the house. Very woke. Now the house is even more gunky with the mouldy groves having spread and covered more surface area and in order to progress we have to pop more eyes. If you haven't noticed by now, a staple of the game is introducing a new mechanic and then hamming it out until it's very mundane and slightly irritating. I suppose this is the curse of a small dev team, creating a new mechanic and testing them is extremely resource and time intensive, so new mechanics do have to be spread out to improve their longevity. If you didn't believe me, hey here's another wheelchair, <laughs> oh sick chair bro, let's take a little seat and I wonder where we'll end up. Nothing especially important happens for the next while, we get to see more context to Rackens and the imprisonment that he had in the hospital. Here, you're all Someone bite him up! It is doctor, right away! Let me out of here! 
After fixing the power and heading to Rackin's old room, we're suddenly ambushed by an even lower quality blender model of a man who injects us with his missing polygons. The only way out of the room is through a hole in the wall, making our way through the pipes and landing in a large dark expanse, with two very large fences on either side, holding off an army of faceless, eyeless monsters watching your every step. After looking into the TV, we appear in front of a giant eye. Turning around, we see a maze littered with TVs, each one containing a staring eye. The chapter seems to have a large emphasis on eyes. This can be attributed to Rakan suffering from scophobia, so sco scopophobia, a fear of being stared at. This section is yet another maze, very similar to the furniture maze we encountered in the Lucy chapter, except now we have to grab a knife in order to cut our way through the eye and escape. The color palette here, I think, is actually very gorgeous in a weird way. It's a pure gray tone, undercut by static glow from the TV sets. It's a great set piece. Stabbing the eye, it causes it to spaz out and implode on itself. Very helpful for us because the dead little eye tunnel leads us straight to the electrical box that we have to fix, enabling our escape. Now we're at the end of the chapter. Here we see Rakans after being discharged from the hospital for good boy behaviour, trapped in the basement of the house where we can see him arguing with an unknown entity before the demon appears at the door, sealing him in the basement forever. You can faintly hear screaming in the darkness and it's unclear exactly what fate became him other than, you know, he got Bobby murdered. This chapter was an interesting one. I think it raises more questions than answers. Why is the demon so invested in haunting Rakans? Does it follow anyone once they enter the house? Does the demon specifically target mentally ill people? Is there even a demon or is it just coincidence that mentally ill people always live in this house? Chapter 4 was the final chapter and these questions are never specifically answered. We're only left to make our own assumptions, something I'll cover in just a moment. Overall, I think it's a good chapter, a decent one to finish the game on. It took a big risk by moving the main location out of the house, something that doesn't always pay off, but it adds some much needed diversity to the variety of the game. I mean, what more could they have done in the confines of the house for a third chapter? It's one of the shortest chapters, but it's also not massively convoluted like the mirror puzzles of the Dolores chapters, so that could explain why it was a bit quicker to get through. The enemy design and modelling is at times pretty fucking awful, but as I said, this chapter took the biggest risk and the biggest change, so you have to respect them for that. If I had to rank the three chapters, I would say it goes Lucy's chapter, then Dolores, then Rakan's. That's not to say I didn't enjoy his chapter, I just don't think it was as terrifying as the previous chapters. So now we've wrapped up those chapters like an extra hot burrito from Taco Bell, this is the end of the game. Of course, us being alpha males, we're not going to settle for some half-assed endings. While other chapters are about the previous inhabitants of the house, the tapes are all about the protagonist, Dwayne. Wait, have I even said our name yet? Yeah, we're called Dwayne. Dwayne the Six Shooter Man. This is his final chapter. This is our chapter. Every one of these tapes relates to a cardinal sin, and every one contains a small story that outlines more about Dwayne's backstory and how he arrived at this point. Now I'm not going to go into great detail about each and every one, I'll save that for you if you want to play the game yourself, and the video is already long enough, but it gives a lot of insight into Dwayne's life and the mistakes that led to his current mental state. Things like a tragic accident leading to the death of multiple people. We also get more insight into his ongoing alcohol and drug addiction. Please talk to me. I love you, Dwayne. I want to help you. First the alcohol and now this? Who prescribed you this and why? I want to know so I can help you through it. Are you slowly going insane, Dwayne? 
Should we be worried because we are? To their credit, the tapes do also offer some cool new areas to explore, a highlight of which is a massive industrial complex that you have to walk around filled with pipes and rusted metal. It's a really nice change of pace, much like the hospital level, and you have to respect them introducing these big new set pieces at such a late stage of the game. But at the end of every tape, you receive a mask fragment, and this is where it's important because you need to collect all the mask fragments to unlock the true ending for the game. Once we finish constructing the mask, we take our final few steps, pick up the mask, and place it on our face. Once on, the house is different. This time though, it's not corrupted. It hasn't turned against us. Instead, it's the polar opposite. It's bright, clean. The evil is past. We cross the threshold of the house one last time, down into the basement, and finally, we get closure. This section is filled with some great symbolism. The game itself is called Visage, visage meaning face, and in this ending, to escape, we have to wear a mask to hide our face and slip out. Exploring the deeper meaning here, it's clear that the house traps the souls of its victims. It typically does so by manipulating them into committing horrific acts, either on themselves or on other people. The demon we regularly see lurking behind the scene, it appears to be the main villain behind the event. It's unclear as to why it does these things. Perhaps it's a creature of pure evil that revels in the suffering, or perhaps it survives by consuming the souls of its victims. Regardless of that, it seems to be the driving force behind all the terrible occurrences of the game. Lucy killed her pet bird and took her own life. Dolores killed her husband, then hung herself. Rakan's was really whingy, I guess. I, I, I don't know. You hear me, fuckers? I'm on to you! As we saw in the beginning of the game, we, the player, killed our family with a revolver, then presumably took our own life. It's my belief that much like the other spirits, we were corrupted and manipulated into committing the horrific act, one that trapped and bound our soul to the house. There are numerous references to Dwayne being addicted to drugs and alcohol. Now, now, Dwayne, shush, shush, shush a little bit and take a sip. Remember, you and me, we go a long way. I'm on your side. Why don't we take a little sip to our friendship? It could be argued that all the events of the house were manic episodes taking place in the broken mind of the player, trying to cope with his addiction and depression, but it seems unlikely that this is all in his head, because this wouldn't explain all the previous owner's mysterious deaths. All of the characters involved do have mental health issues, uh, it's unclear however if the house is a catalyst for mental health problems or if it simply attracts them to the house. Regardless, it would seem that the game takes place in a purgatory state in which our spirit is trapped. In order to leave, we have to construct the mask, this visage, to hide our soul from the evil powers residing in the house. Once hidden, we're free. We can escape the house and return to our family. A family that can hopefully understand the corruption of the house and forgive Dwayne for the horrific acts he committed. Taking this even further, it could be argued that Dwayne is actually in hell for the murder of his family and that to escape from hell, he had to hide his face from God in order to trick his way into heaven under the guise of another face, another visage. There are countless references to heaven and hell and religious figures throughout the game, so this shouldn't be a possibility to rule out. Whichever you choose to believe, the endings and plots are ambiguous enough to give closure, but also allow the player to imprint whichever theory they want for their own ending. But I am curious as to what you guys think of the ending, so let me know in the comments now what your interpretation of the ending is, whether or not you think it's a purgatory, a mental breakdown, whatever theory you can come up with, let me know in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to mull over it in front of my grand fireplace like a man of culture. But hey, did you know that there's also a third secret ending? Ooh wee, secrets! You can actually get the secret ending at any time, all you gotta do is head here in the basement. You can break through it at any time. Remember this room from the intro scene? Well now we can finish the game, except there's only one player left, and you get the option to bite the bullet.
This ending is short but sweet. It sees us, the player, calling it quits before taking our own life. They can't handle the fear, the house wins. It's a depressing ending, but one that gives us insight into the potential psychology of the player. This ending shows us how vital it is to piece together the true ending for the player because if we don't, this is where he'll end up, in a void, without hope or closure. Being realistic, ain't no normal person running around this house gonna be sane. A lot of people would just pull the plug. It might be an easter egg ending, but it's probably the most realistic one in the game. Visage is an extremely well-made horror game, even when compared to the majority of recent AAA releases. Are there areas that could be improved? Yeah, 100%. The addition of some combat would be a great start, but this is a passion project made by a small team of developers. It is in fact the very first game they've made, and that's just crazy that a small, newly formed indie studio could pull this off. It blows my mind. I really hope to see more from this studio. Hopefully they made enough money on Visage to fund their next project, and you, the viewer at home, if you love horror games, I insist you pick this game up. Even if you've watched this video in its entirety, there's just no comparison to actually playing the game yourself. It's a genuine horror experience that few games can compete with. To conclude, well done to Sad Square Studios for making such a passionate game to scare the crap out of the sadists like me that love the pain. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.